Good afternoon um, to those of you who are in Europe and Africa, and good morning to those of you who are in the United States joining us, and welcome to the panel on Connecting Realities to Champion Protection of Civilians. My name is Marla Keenan. I'm a senior fellow at the Stimson Center, where I focus on NATO and the important work that they are doing to implement their 2016 Protection of Civilians policy, which is grac graciously supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, over the past decade and a half of my career, I have focused on working with organizations that research the impact of war on civilians. And while much of the research itself happens within conflict areas, the goal always is to link the civilians who live through conflict with those in the, pow in the halls of power who can make change on their behalf. Um, th this panel is focused just on that um, and on connecting these diverse realities to ensure that civilians are better protected in current and future conflicts. I've been struck a bit this week uh, by just how many times we've heard from our panelists um, discussing the disconnect between what happens on the ground and what happens um, in, in capitals around the world, um, especially in places where there are assumptions about high level policies and, and how those are made and decided upon and, and how they affect civilians on the ground. Um, for example, on Wednesday, we heard about the Afghan uh, withdrawal and just how civilians were completely caught off guard and they had no way to know what they should do, how to protect their families, how to get out, or just how to stay safe where they were. Um, I continue to do evacuation work um, to this day as a volunteer, and it really um, is concerning to me just how much, um, you know, in the United States, which is where I live, just how much our policymakers are learning from volunteers just like me every day. Um, before I get started on introducing our amazing speakers here, I wanna do just a couple of very quick housekeeping things. Um, the first is please post your questions on Slido. Um, I think we, we see that many people are engaged this morning and we're seeing some questions already coming in, so thank you for that. They will be moderated um, by our staff here and then they will be fed to us so that we can try and answer as many as we can. Um, please visit the speakers tab because while I'm going to give a brief introduction to each of our colleagues here, uh, I will not be able to touch on all of the amazing things that they've done in their career. Um, the last uh, part of the, the platform has the resource library. Again, there are lots of resources from the organizations that you see supported here, um, talking to you know, policy papers and briefing papers uh, about the topics that we're gonna discuss today. Um, there's a help desk in case you need it. And also please, um, if you're inspired by the discussions that you hear today, We'd love to hear from you on social media, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn. Please um, feel free to tag uh, PAX Protection of Civilians, uh, or PAX POC 2021, that's the hashtag. I think, oh, just one more last note. Please remember that this uh, event is being recorded and that it will be available online afterwards. So all that we're saying here is public uh, information. Okay, let's get started. I'm incredibly honored today to be joined by two colleagues from Iraq and Chad, and um, two representatives from the Dutch government. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to briefly introduce you now, um, but again, I encourage you to read their complete bios on uh, our website. So Dr. Hassan Jawad, Kadim is a political advisor and analyst of politics in the Middle East. He was the former political advisor to the Minister of Interior and is currently the foreign relations advisor to the National Security Advisor. He is also the official focal point between the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, and the Office of the National Security Advisor. Dr. Olivier Gayanan. Uh, is from Chad and is a social anthropologist. He is also the director, the executive director of Bucofor. Olivier focuses his research and interests on the security sector in the Sahel. Lars Valrev is the director of international affairs at the Dutch Ministry of Defense. He attended officer training school at the Royal Netherlands Naval College and obtained a doctorate in international law from Utrecht University. Lars has fulfilled various operational and staff positions within the Royal Netherlands Navy. After more than a decade in various positions at the Directorate of uh, Kingdom Relations, he returned to the Ministry of Defense at the beginning of 2019. Mariette Sherman is the Director of Stability and Humanitarian Aid in the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Previously, she acted as the Human Rights Ambassador of the Ministry and coordinated the Dutch membership of the UN uh, Security Council in 2018. Between 2014 and 2017, she served as NATO's Special Representative for Women, Peace, and Security, 
and in tw until 2014, she was the Dutch ambassador to the Republic of North Macedonia. So, Gassan, going to hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure, actually, to be part of this uh, panel, which is, uh, includes uh, experts and uh, expertise uh, from Netherlands, of course, uh, as uh, official attendees, and from Chad, uh, my colleague, uh, Olivier. Uh, and thank you very much for PAX to uh, offer this opportunity, actually, to express ideas and to uh, uh, express network and exchange network between uh, others. Uh, I will start uh, in, 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 uh, in wording uh, uh, in Arabic. And I, I need translation uh, from you both, actually, <laughs> to translate it. Inshallah, bukra rah nsafar ila Turkiya. ونخلص كل أمورنا بإذن الله وراح نرجع نتواصل وياكم. It's so difficult to translate it uh, because uh, you need kind of interpreter to attend and to translate to you the exact word. Maybe I said it in a slang language, mm -hmm. and actually I said uh, uh, thank God that uh, we finished everything and we are leaving to uh, uh, Istanbul tomorrow morning. Uh, but what I'm trying to say. Uh, the language is, in my area, in my region, is not just about te text or interpreting. It's history. It's religion. So when you learn the language, you will learn the culture. And when you learn the culture, as uh, our previous panelist, the uh, general, mentioned, uh, it's how to engage with others. And actually, it seems that our main topic our main topic talking about the engagement and the right information between the, uh, the culture or the war or the conflict zone and the capitals. And there is, there is an area, a blurry area between them missing. It's a gap of information or maybe bureaucracy. Maybe bureaucracy, maybe there's some information sent from the ground to the capitals, but it takes like, uh, Days, maybe, maybe minutes, maybe hours, but uh, you know, minutes for people's lives, it's means. And I remember that we have uh, like hundreds of examples of how important to involve the culture and how important to make that links between the capitals and uh, the ground. And I remember too many cases, not just Hawija, our main. Uh, uh, you know, topic here. Uh, for instance, in 1991, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, as they call it, uh, the, the, the liberation of Iraq, if I may say, the liberation of Kuwait, actually. They attack a shelter, shelter full of people, full of families uh, at that time, during uh, 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 the time of President Bush, uh, the junior. Uh, the shelter includes many of families and of course, the reason behind that attacks with the clever uh, uh, rockets uh, or technical rockets, they said there is a government uh, officials uh, at that time being part of that uh, Amaria shelter. And many cases came after, uh, for instance, the siege in our country since 1991 till 2003. Too many kids has been passed away because of lack of milk. And when they ask uh, uh, Ms. Madeleine Albright, is it worth that 500,000 kids passed away uh, you know, to get rid of Saddam Hussein? She said, it's worth it. What I'm saying, what past is past, but people think about their families and their uh, blood. Uh, yes, you might do your uh, attack, and turn your face to other page or signing, for instance, uh, the daily work. But there's family suffering in that area. You should always be uh, uh, aware about them. You should always think that these family will reflect badly on the future, will back to you on many ways of, of revenge, if I may say. Ways of revenge against your country or against the society. Uh, I will mention, uh, a uh, a kind of uh, successful case, uh, actually, of 
solving, being kind of a solver of problem. Uh, and let me know if I pass the time, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because I will talk in Arabic again. Uh, <laughs> it happens in 2008 uh, that we have an election, provincial council uh, election, uh, and one of the provinces uh, includes kind of a sectarian or let's say entity conflicts uh, between Kurds and Arabs in Mosul. And after the winning of the seats at the provincial council, they refused to sit on one table uh, as a council to work on the provincial council level. And the UN representative, the embassies, they've been struggled to make them sit together uh, on one table. At that time, I, uh, I was working with the International uh, Republican Institutes, the IRI, uh, and I've been uh, appointed to be kind of in charge uh, of something called the special projects, which is uh, anything difficult, they send me uh, you know, to that place. And I was approaching both sides, and with help of the embassy, US embassy, uh, because it's uh, out of our IRI scope of work, uh, fund, of course, we got fund to gather everybody together in Istanbul and to, sort, to sit on the first session, the first table together to start solving the problem. It's, it's an example of successful approach from the ground to solve a ground issue or a ground conflict from a capital, from outside capital. And I can give another example, but maybe when we come to the other questions, especially the NATO mission in Iraq, uh, I can uh, tell you another example of successful story. And we will come to the bad stories too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Olivier. Okay. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Uh, I would like to, to make mine the, the recommendation of my colleague Hassan. And uh, you, I will start by maybe uh, into, to introduce to you the, the key issues, the security issues in the Sahel. So uh, first of all, I, I would like to, to, to introduce to you my country, Chad, because the audience <laughs> may not uh, know uh, what is Chad. Chad is uh, a country surrounded by the big hot spots, security hot spots in Africa. You know, we, we share 1,000 kilometers with the, the Libya. And uh, in the south, we have uh, uh, Central Africa, uh, which is uh, uh, facing uh, various armed groups also in, in, inside. And uh, in the west, we have uh, Darfur, the Darfur region. And uh, in the, 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 the west of the, the, the country, you, you know, we have the, the Lake Chad Basin. So we are surrounded by the, the big hotspots, security hotspots in, in Africa. So it can just justify our uh, engagement in, in the, the main uh, international uh, fights against uh, terrorism. In Mali, we, since 2013, uh, Chad, uh, has been uh, provided troops to, to the, the national, uh, national, uh, United Nations missions. Also the G5 forces, uh, we are uh, providing uh, forces in, to Niger and also to the, the region called the Liptako Gruma uh, zone. So we are, uh, we can regard us as a, a lich paint of uh, the, the, the struggle against uh, terrorism and also uh, the criminal groups uh, in, in the Sahel. But uh, that's the, I, I think that's our um, uh, positive uh, strength in terms of uh, engagement, international engagement against terrorism. But also in terms of um, uh, basic rights, uh, <laughs> we, we are known as a, a country of bans. So, you know, uh, internet or network, uh, social networks, uh, shutdowns are common. And uh, it is uh, forbidden to, to demonstrate in chat. You know, so if you, you are hungry or you, you, you don't accept any uh, unjust law, you, you have to, 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 to die because it is not possible for you to, 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 to demonstrate. And uh, I would like to, to mention the, the role of international actors in, in this area, in this environment, uh, as we are 
the linchpin of the, the, the international uh, fight against terrorism, we, we have been uh, enjoying uh, many international sport from France, from the US, and uh, also from the Dutch government, because uh, in 2019, uh, the Dutch government uh, opened the diplomatic office in, in Jamena. And uh, I think that uh, the added value of your presence in our country is that uh, the, the first diplomat that uh, serve has the, the local uh, uh, po uh, po focal point in, in Chad uh, was a great man because uh, he brought a, an idea that uh, it is important for the Western countries to provide us with intelligent uh, support, also with the military support, but it is extremely important to, to support local uh, NGOs in order to, to, to help uh, people uh, better understand what is uh, going on. So I, I think that we are uh, this country that uh, is very big in terms of war experience, because the, 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 the first uh, rebellion uh, started in 1963. It means uh, three years after uh, the independence gain. So uh, we are very experienced in <laughs> rebellions and what is uh, uh, wrong for the, the development uh, initiatives. So uh, we, we, have, we, we need, we need uh, uh, solid institutions. I mean, uh, we need democracy because uh, for, during uh, 40 years, we are uh, experiencing, uh, you know, uh, dictatorship. Uh, the president has died <laughs> in front uh, after 30 years of uh, ruling. Mm -hmm. And now we have his son has a president, a traditional president. And we, we are, we, we are uh, uh, witnessing some uh, actions that uh, will lead us to, 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 to the, 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 the presidency uh, family to, to, to keep the lead of the, the country in terms of uh, power sharing. So uh, these are our uh, local and also uh, salient uh, uh, challenges that we have to overcome in order to uh, expect better peace for this region. So I, I have shown uh, already the, the, the attacks against civilians. You know, even the, the, the regular forces are a big threat for the civilians in, in this region. So when you want to support uh, security forces, you have to also demand uh, human rights respect in order to uh, better change the situation in the Sahel. So thank you very much. And uh, I can answer any question you would like to ask me. Great. Mm. Lars. Um, well, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. And, and I think it's good to, to well, change perspectives and, and discuss this. Um, I think protection of civilians is a theme which, well, we're never done learning. Uh, and a theme that constitutes an important part of our work. Uh, in what, uh, our mission in the Dutch Ministry of Defense is to protect what holds us dear. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, civilians. And, and our soldiers, our men and women, are required to perform their duties, of course, in very difficult circumstances, work under high pressure, um, perform to the best of their ability uh, with the knowledge and the capabilities they have, always with partners or mostly at partners. And I think they're fair, very well aware of the responsibility they have on their shoulders. Eh? They have been trained for this, they've been educated for this. But despite of this, uh, as civilians can be harmed uh, in conflict. And this is an honest, but a painful reality. This is the truth we're having to deal with. But I think what we have to learn from this is that we always try to, well, improve our actions, continue to learn, evaluate, and that we have conversations like we have today about what we can improve on what we do for our work, for our jobs. Um, a lot has been said yesterday, especially on, on Hawija, eh, Dutch bombardment on a, on a bomb factory during the night of 2 to 3 June 2015. It's had a great impact, eh, first and foremost on the local and civilian population, but be assured also on the Dutch military and defense organization. Uh, and we need and we wish to learn from what happened over there. What next steps can we take? What can we do? 
Uh, and which I, well, I'm a bit proud of to mention, we had intense parliamentary debates on, on Hawija, uh, not this year, the year before. And from it comes a, a conversation, a series of conversations with NGOs, PAX uh, uh, in the lead, uh, together with us, the Ministry of Defense. We had well, several sessions talking to each other, trying to learn from each other, not always agreeing with each other. I have to agree as well, but at least talking to each other, which is part of the process, I think. And um, what we do now is where we, we made up a set of 10 recommendations, what we learned from these discussions, yeah, where we can improve, what can we do, can we be more transparent, can we, whatever. Uh, so this set is, is, well, almost ready. Uh, it's on the desk of our minister. So it's another way for us to learn from, one, from what happens in, in real life, uh, which, well, we hope to, uh, we try to prevent, and if not, be more transparent on what we do and how we do it and why we do it. So that's the way we're trying to work with these well, difficult themes, and especially for, for the people uh, on the ground, the civilians on the one side, and the military professionals on the, on the other hand, from which we can demand as well. They do their work to their, well, to their best extent and with the best uh, methods and, and things we can give them to do their jobs honestly and in the best way. Okay, great. Thank you. Mariette? Yeah, I, I would like to pick up on, on Lars's point on learning, because I think it's um, really um, what Hassan and Olivier and Lars said, but also General Stavridis um, in, in the interview. Um, this has been a long process of learning, um, and it's important to have the different perspectives um, with respect for each other's mandates, for each other's knowledge and experience, but to do ever better on protection of civilians. And if there's one thing that I learned from working with the military uh, on protection of civilians, it's indeed, you know, as General Stavridis also said, that, that protection of people is the core of our mandate in peacekeeping. Um, uh, I think it was uh, General um, um, Safiri, um, is it? Um, yeah, Safari, Daniel Safari from Rwanda, with whom we, we worked on protection of civilians, also in the peacekeeping uh, reforms. Uh, he would indeed say, you know, as a military, we were, we, we were created to protect people. And it doesn't matter if it's my own people or the people of the country where I'm deployed. Um, and I think um, uh, General Kamard always said the same thing. You know, if, if we're not here to protect people, what, what, what are we doing here? Um, and so I think this sort of people-centered approach, um, it has been very much core to our learning journey on protection, uh, protection of civilians. And I think Stavridi said it really, really well. You know, it's not only a fundamental thing, it's the right thing to do because this is um, a people-centered, a rights-based approach. People need protection. Um, um, it's living up to our international obligations, but it's also a smart thing to do, a pragmatic thing to do, and an efficient thing to do. Um, I think for us, um, the integrated approach that was al already mentioned, you know, to work from the different perspectives to this common goal and common obligation that we have to uphold international humanitarian law and to protect people, whoever is in danger, um, this to bring together this, you know, th these different perspectives in, in a coordinated, integrated, comprehensive approach is a very critical one because that will allow us to do better. You know, we get more, we get smarter uh, and more innovative if we bring those different um, um, perspectives together. But first and foremost, I think the lessons learned is really to listen to the needs of the people and to understand, as you said, you know, in, in terms of understanding the culture and the language, the impact that we have um, through our presence and we want to avoid or how to you have the impact we want to have, which is in the end, you know, a safe and secure environment and lasting peace and security for the people at risk and how we can deliver better on that promise by working better together. Um, so it's, it's a, um, it is, a complicated things. Uh, it's a very dynamic field. We continue learning and doing better, learning a lot from mistakes, unfortunately. 
um, I would say, but at least, you know, we, we try to, to improve better in terms of cooperation, but also in to do better in terms of involving and engaging with the population to understand their security needs, mm -hmm. to deliver better on those and adapt to those. Um, and I think really to gradually evolve really to put people first. And I think this is another big lesson, uh, not only that by having a comprehensive approach, we perform better, um, we have better solutions, but also by pe putting people first in everything we do, be it in peace building and peacekeeping or in development or in access to justice and accountability, putting people first is a common goal, but it helps us to deliver better and to do even ever better on in terms of um, uh, protecting people. So again, I think protection of civilians is a core task, it's a core mandate, it's a shared responsibility, and it really requires the different perspectives and the different actors to come together and to see what we can do better in terms of really fulfilling the security needs of the people uh, that we need to protect. And maybe I always jealous with mm -hmm. The mission of my Ministry of Defence, I wish it was the, mis the mission of the Ministry <laughs> of Foreign Affairs, is to protect everything that's dear to us. And I think that's our job, you know, that's the common challenge. Um, and that's why we need to bring back uh, together different perspectives, and particularly the perspectives of the local people. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was actually really interesting because I heard you both talking about how broad sort of the, the protection landscape is in a given country and how diverse it can be and how challenging it can be. And then I heard both of you talk about as a team working together between the two and protection of civilians is not just something the military does, right? We know this. It's something that's sort of a comprehensive approach as, as um, the Admiral said. And so I, I'm gonna take just a moment to mention something about um, NATO and their protection of civilians policy, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And certainly in Iraq, it, it touches on, on, on your country. And certainly the countries that are involved in NATO also have a role to play in Chad. Um, but their protection of civilians policy is very much rooted in that human security um, sort of space that you were talking about, you know, creating a safe and secure environment. And I wonder if perhaps the two of you together could answer a little bit, like how, how is the role of a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, and a Ministry of Defense, how do you negotiate that space and know who's responsible for what when you're really looking at a very comprehensive um, protection conundrum, if you will? That's a very large question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm happy you mentioned, I think that we shared a concept, I mean, that's a starting point of human security. Mm -hmm understanding that um, um, a conflict and also peacekeeping has an impact, not only a direct impact on people mm -hmm. in terms of the risk of lo loss of life, loss of infrastructure, but also indirect secondary uh, effects, uh, trauma, but also loss of livelihoods, uh, loss of access to education and health. Mm -hmm. And it has a long impact on the resilience of people and their ability to recover and build a better, rebuild a better future. Um, so I think, as I said, you know, having this human people first lens basically helps us from, with respect from the difference in the mandate mm. that we have and the different of tools we have in our toolkit to at least be, to agree on the common goal. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the concept of human security is so important that we have, we know what the common goal is, mm -hmm. but we also know that we have different mandates and where we can strengthen each other and help each other in delivering better on our respective mandates. Uh, to add on a more, well, maybe more practical note, <laughs> uh, it, it's first and foremost about well understanding the conflict, uh, what, what, what's ongoing, what's needed. Uh, it might be a, a more military-focused solution, mm. uh, but it's not always only military. Uh, it's, it's always the whole set of skills, methods, means, capabilities we have. And, and, and we really discussed this in between us. Uh, we have in the Netherlands this... this uh, group, uh, civil servants, MFA, justice, uh, prime minister's office, uh, defense, and we discuss these things. Okay, if, if we see there's a problem, I can mention Sahel. Huh? Of course, we're looking at Sahel. We're there present huh? in different forms, but in small, small amounts. Um, but then we look at, well, what's really needed and how can we help in a 
way that really helps. Yeah? And, and sometimes it's more well development uh, focused, sometimes it's more military focused, but then make sure there are others that take the other role. So that's always yeah. well something to mm. be taken into account and to be discussed uh, between well, the different uh, involved uh, ministries in the Netherlands. Okay, sure. great. I'm gonna head to the questions over um, in Slido now. The first one that I see here says, um, Admiral Stavridis argues that a champion country should build a center of excellence on POC and that this could be something that the Netherlands might consider leading. Do you agree? I think that would be more. <laughs> Certainly we understand you can't yeah. <laughs> oblige your whole of government today, but <laughs> your personal view maybe. Um. I'll make it easy for you and start off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of we'll speak for the Ministry of Defense. Um, because it's, it's, it has been coming up before. And when mm -hmm. I was a NATO representative uh, for Women, Peace and Security, I had the privilege to also be given the file of protection of civilians mm -hmm. and the, 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 the NATO policy and the doctrine and the whole tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Netherlands already has a center of excellence that played a critical part mm -hmm. in that development of that doctrine, which is the, 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 the center of excellence on, on civil military cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue, because there's already many um, um, centers of excellence, mm -hmm that we should use the ones that we already have that can champion this. And as I, th as I said, this, you, the Netherlands is one of the champions, definitely not, not, not all, uh, within the NATO community amongst allies. And we already have, as, uh, I think, a center of excellence that has an excellent operation, uh, a reputation, and that already has been critical in developing policies, guidelines, uh, and, uh, and training. So. To add, um, I think it's more about what we do mm. than, than the form we chose we, we choose for it. So it, it's about the contribution we can deliver, the things we do, the acts we can can do together, mm -hmm. uh, instead of having a center of excellence, which well might do nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think it, that's more mm. important for me than having this institution. I think it's important to have this uh, theme on the agenda, to be active on it. Um, but will this really require a center of excellence? This is a, well, something that you can grab or mm -hmm. people put in. I don't know. If it adds, maybe, uh, but not at this moment, I think. Okay. Um, I actually want to come back to you, Kassan. I want to I want to ask if you'd be willing to share that story that you shared with me yesterday about NATO and and um, sort of the interaction. That I thought happened. you would ask me about shopping, but then anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we do this afterwards. Uh, <laughs> I, I need just to back on uh, one thing that uh, we've been, uh, that actually, excuse my uh, cynical here, uh, uh, you've been talking about learning. Mm. And actually, it's for you, it's learning. We are not school, I mean, to learn from us. Mm. Uh, since 80s, we are facing mistakes, 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 mm -hmm. till now, and you couldn't learn lesson. I mean, when are you going to learn? That's, that's a question mm. in my mind. I mean, does your learning process have like timing? Or you should have a mistake and you will say, I will learn. Okay, I will learn from that mistake and will continue the same mistake. It happens in 2007, mm -hmm. Blackwater attack civilians in my city. And it was a mistake. And sorry is not enough. Mm -hmm. To pay money for the victims uh, uh, or, or, or casualties, it's a cheap thing. I mean, it's 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 very cheap. I mean, uh, as as uh, we we rely on the previous uh, uh, panel uh, a lot, uh, we should share this. You know, the condolence. We should go to the to the uh, place of of sadness. The people who lost their life by by uh, incidents, uh, as you call it. In my opinion, it's a mistake, and back on sharing information between the ministries as a government of Netherlands. I'm sorry, I, I will not talk in behalf of your government, but I think every government has an embassy. Each embassy has a security representative. That means the Minister of Defense or Ministry of Interior or maybe Intelligence. And that means there is a cooperation between both, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a lot of uh, uh, learning process and sharing of information between the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of, of, of Defense. But the, the government of Netherlands knows about Hawija after four years and a half. So where is the sharing of information here? 
So this is what you know uh, makes me feel that this there's some issue with with your communication, uh, and uh, your communication make us pay blood. But anyway, back to uh, Marla uh, story. Uh, because I, I was uh, appointed with, with the uh, NSA as his foreign affairs uh, advisor, uh, uh, because I'm good looking uh, <laughs> on camera, actually. Uh, so uh, it happens that uh, the, the NATO mission uh, start their work in Iraq as a training uh, uh, organization in 2005. But as a legitimate existence, there is no legitimate existence for NATO. Uh, but after the talks about the withdrawal and the voting happens in our parliaments, uh, uh, it seems that there is a need of uh, a mission like NATO to be in our country. For us, it's more training and consultation, uh, uh, which is the same thing with the coalition currently. But with the coalition, there is a lot of kind of uh, stories and blurry areas with the coalition because they have like uh, an operation side of it. So we've been talking about how we cooperate with the NATO and preparing for cooperation uh, uh, memorandum of understanding between the two governments. And of course, the system of NATO takes like 30 countries, defense and politics side to agree, and that's very difficult, especially after the corona. Uh, we had uh, prepared the paper for the co cooperation between both sides. And I was not that involved on, you know, legal part of, 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 uh, of their cooperation. But suddenly we heard through media that the General Secretary of NATO mentioned very uh, a critical wording on media after the meeting, uh, uh, I think in Brussels, when he mentioned that we will have 4,500 fighter in Iraq. And we've been struggling telling the commander in Baghdad, don't talk about numbering. It's a very sensitive issue. Mm. So be aware about it. And he's supposed to report this information to his uh, 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 you know, uh, chain of command. That's create a big issue. And usually in Baghdad, there's kind of every hour, there's some issue you know, to be breaking news. And because of we've been talking about the withdrawal of the coalition and the foreign uh, uh, forces, it became like an issue that we are replacing the coalition with NATO mission. So it's like a joke for, for some people, mm -hmm. why you are doing that. And that's create problem between the government of Iraq and the NATO that we will not sign between, uh, between us, or they already signed, but we will not cooperate. That needs kind of a red line under the table to talk and communicate to reach out a solution. And it was uh, uh, head to me, actually, that I should be that person from uh, the NSA and uh, a political advisor from NATO. Uh, you'll be happy he's American. Uh, to communicate and sit together, talk about what happens tell him about the culture and why they became very angry as Iraqis mm. and how they can act. So we set some, some points to return the dignity to Iraqis that this is what happens and this is bad. We should change this commander and bring a new one because this commander was not following the Iraqi government as they suppose. And we end up with changing the commander, uh, uh, Danish, commander, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is, uh, I do respect uh, his commanding, uh, but it was kind of a political advisor of, of the commander or culture advisor uh, born uh, in, uh, in Denmark, and they appoint him as a culture uh, advisor. He's from Iraqi family, but he never been in Iraq. So he, they rely on these advices, uh, but it was bad. And when they changed him, things has been get better and better. And eventually we agreed to sit together with the NSA and things has been shifted to a success. And there is no mentioning even about numbering anymore. 
And even, even our NSA mentioned that you can release the numbers because we are cooperating and we both have the same media report. So this is one of the successful uh, arenas that you know, uh, I can share. Mm -hmm. uh, if you allow me, uh, uh, Marla, mm -hmm. there is uh, 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 another issue with American policy. Mm. Uh, 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 if I may say it's failed. They left people in cold uh, 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 after using the, 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 the new way of soft power mm. to use institutes, organizations to, uh, you know, promote democracy in my country because we came to democracy just in 18 years ago, unfortunately. I've been working with IRI since 2005 mm. and for... Uh, uh, for uh, financial issues, political issues, they decide to close the office in 2013. I was kidnapped twice at that period, since 2005 till 2013. They've been bombing civil war in Iraq between 2005, 2008. We've been facing a lot of issues, tribal issues, awakening, if you remember, Qaeda. And in 2013, the organization decide just to close the office, and that's it. Bye. We left in cold. Mm. So it's the same example that the general mentioned about the Afghan. Mm. They can be good community for the United States if you offer them uh, 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 opportunity. But Iraqis at that time with IRI, they've been angry because they left in cold. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Olivier for just a moment here because I want to hear a little bit about the research that you've done on security systems in the Sahel. And if you see there um, the presence of any POC issues in that security training, particularly by Western forces. Okay. Thank you very much. So I would like first to start by uh, showing you our uh, role in this uh, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a research uh, center. It means that uh, we, we carry out uh, researches on the security issues. And uh, we advise uh, donors uh, in order to, to better uh, help people, communities, and uh, also uh, the, the security forces. So, uh, uh, you know, we are between donors and communities. But uh, I would like to let you know that if you, you take the Sahelian countries, the, the G5 countries, uh, Burkina, Mali, Niger, and Mauritania can uh, allow people uh, carrying out studies on security issues and also the, the, the insecurity dynamics. But in Chad, it is like forbidden because mm -hmm. they, they, they don't want uh, researchers and they, they don't want uh, people who don't uh, belong to the security uh, sector. So uh, we, we, we face this challenge in our country to, to be accepted, you know. Uh, how can we uh, be accepted when people, uh, the, the authorities don't want uh, our results, they, they don't uh, need our, uh, you know, you, uh, research activities. So this is the, the first challenge. But uh, uh, fortunately, we, we, are, we are supported by uh, the Western uh, government like Dutch government and also the, the EU representative in, in Chad. So uh, they, they they sometimes uh, give us opportunity to, to, to carry out uh, studies in the development uh, areas in order to, to finance, to found uh, our activities in the security sector. So that's what we are doing in, in this environment. And also, you know, when you, um, you take the, the, the main Western countries uh, uh, represented in, the, in Chad, uh, you, you have the, the U.S., that is the big uh, support in uh, military intelligence and mm -hmm. also um, training of the military forces. You, you have France, <laughs> you know its role in the Sahel, and uh, also the EU, uh, which is using the, the, the program approach uh, 
to, to help security and uh, reforms in, in the security sector. So uh, you are the newcomers. I, I, when I say you, the, the Dutch government is uh, a newcomer. And also many uh, European countries have just uh, opened the diplomatic bureaus in, in Jamena. So uh, I think that with the, the massive presence of these actors, we, we hope that uh, things will move and also uh, hope that the support in terms of diplomatic support and also security because we are threat, <laughs> so we, mm -hmm. we need the security uh, protection. So uh, things are uh, going to move uh, for the better for us. And uh, also uh, in terms of the, the, the security perception, you know, uh, the, the main narrative for the government is the fight against terrorism. And when we, we, we collected information about the, the perception, perception of the security, uh, the, the main uh, concern is the food security. Mm. You know, so uh, people uh, think that food security is the, the priority of the, the, the country, and uh, the government thinks that uh, the, the priority is the fight against terrorism. So we are uh, helping people, donors, and other actors to, to, to better decide uh, among these uh, issues and also uh, many challenges to be overcome in this area. So uh, it, is, uh, it is what we are doing in a hostile uh, context and also uh, with uh, many um, actors that are twin with the dictatorship and you know the, the Central Africa countries are <laughs> ruled by the dictatorship. So uh, broadly speaking, it is what I can uh, put uh, uh, to your attention in terms of challenges. Okay, great. I'm gonna go back here to our, our Slido deck here. Um, this is a question from Anonymous, um, and it says, excellent point by Mr. Kadim uh, that conflict zones are not learning environments. This points to the POC accountability gap. How can that, that best be addressed? I'm not sure who. <laughs> um, yeah, I already wrote it down. <laughs> uh, if mistakes are made, we should learn from that, which means that we should not make them again. And, and that I fully agree. We should show that we, make progress, that we don't make the same mistakes again. Uh, for Hawija, I don't know whether it's communication, I think it's more about transparency. That might have been a mistake. So that's what we're working on. And, and I can't promise that we'll be transparent on, on everything right away. Yeah? There might be military and operational reasons not to, but where we can, we already dealt with part of it, we talked with parliament about it, we will share, we will be more transparent, we will be more open. Not always, uh, that, that, that I have to add. But I think that that's the important thing in it. Okay. Do you have anything to add? No, I was just thinking that I think we we in, developed in Afghanistan some approaches which in in NATO context, which can also be uh, useful to see, you know, to what extent, you know, that those tools and also asking external parties, like I think that in Afghanistan is the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, who actually collects the data mm. on civilian casualties. And that's open and out in the open public information, irrespective of who caused those civilian um, casualties. Um, and, and that, I think, outside and independent pressure is very important to um, be accountable and, you know, increase transparency and accountability. Uh, but also, obviously, everybody suffers, you know, when these mistakes are made. Um, and as you said, they're not cheap. They are very, very expensive. Uh, and I think that to have that external oversight can really help us to act sooner <laughs> on, you know, when these things happen and things go wrong, because, you know, we cannot guarantee that it will never go wrong. But at least, you know, we calculate beforehand to minimize the risks. And at the same time, if we see things go wrong, to analyze how could this happen, you know? And, and um, so, yeah, and uh, so I think there again, you know, there are contexts where we did better. <laughs> on this one, and, and that's also, I think, we, we have to um, see if those, those tools can help. Great, thank you. This reminds me of a discussion around the POC policy back in the day at NATO, um, specifically focused around the making of amends. You know, NATO had a non-binding guidelines on how to make amends if, they, if, if um, any of the countries did harm civilians. 
but that didn't make it into the policy. And I, I, that was a little heartbreaking for some of us, I think, because we knew how important it was in the context of when something happened, like what that meant. So we're still, I think some of us are still kind of trying to work. And I was struck by what the mayor said yesterday, that it was so important that even six years later, an apology and an honest, you know, apology that comes with, you know, this is something we're giving to your family to acknowledge that it's so important. I mean, it really does make a big difference. Um, so sorry, just side note there. <laughs> um, back to our questions here. Uh, what is your view regarding discussions that the EU should have its own army that pop up from time to time, such as recently regarding the Afghanistan situation? I see you no. <laughs> shaking your head. Well, <laughs> it's been a question for some time. The EU will not have its own army, just like NATO doesn't have its own army. Right. It's the nations that form NATO. It's the nations that form the EU. It's about, well, national sovereignty, of course. Mm -hmm. There's close cooperation, as is in NATO, and we're even cooperating more in the EU on, on defense mm -hmm. matters. But this will, well, at least uh, for the Netherlands, and I think many other <laughs> EU nations will agree, will not be an EU army. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, let's see, another one for Mariette. Um, whoa. They keep moving. What risk? Uh, what risk may the integrated approach have um, in not recognizing the definitions of success that differ between military development and diplomacy? Um. I had I was struggling to understand the question actually, <laughs> but I think I I am. Um, uh, actually, I don't agree with the assumption that we don't have the same measure of success. Mm. Uh, but it very much links to Lars's earlier point, like, you know, having a shared analysis and a shared, from there, you know, a shared objectives, shared goal, before you start to decide who's going to do what. And if, you know, that different specific tool in a toolbox is useful at all. Um, uh, so... Um, our intention, and it, it, that is the integration support, is, you know, from a shared analysis and a common objective, decide who's going to do what. So we, I think our shared definition of success is lasting peace and security mm -hmm. for everybody globally, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's what we try to, to, to work on. Yeah, I think that's where that human security sort of broader lens comes in and is really quite yeah. helpful in yeah. looking toward the future. I mean, there are certain times when conflict is the situation, but I think... Yeah, but I think I think uh, the Admiral made it very clear as well. You know, you have, you know, that longer term perspective, you know, you may not always with military means that may not be the right tool and it may only be in the short term, but it has to be followed up with longer term interventions. Or alternative. Know? In order to make it sustainable yep. or alternative interventions, so no, it's different not. plans together. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think I saw a note on on one of the questions yeah. before that just kind of made the point that security forces or the pointy end of the spear, it's just one of the tools in the toolbox, right? And like, if you really want to have lasting success, it has to run the whole gamut of that yeah. comprehensive. Yeah. And it might change depending on the situation. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's more military heavy, or sometimes it's more diplomacy heavy, mm -hmm. or it's more aid uh, development heavy. It's it's very much depending on the situation. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, actually, one of the examples of mm -hmm. different ways of uh, security and and peace. Uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a huge example in Iraq after the civil war. One football game stops the uh, the civil war. It's when we win the championship, uh, Asia uh, championship, the war has been stopped because Sunni Shia they've been together on streets and 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 uh, unarmed, and uh, of course our way of you know. Uh, you know, uh, festival and uh, winning uh, by using weapons. Uh, but uh, it was kind of a different way of expressing, you know, ways of, uh, uh, of peace. Uh, it's not always about using weapons, uh, actually. It's not always about using uh, 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 trainings, if I may say, because we trained a huge number of leaders None of them currently in position, for instance, uh, some of them, but uh, it's, it's how we understand uh, the situation and prepare ourselves for different scenarios. Uh, this, is, this is my opinion about 
you know, the champion, uh, peace champions, for instance. Mm. And it's, 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 it's came to my mind why you choose Netherlands as the champion of peace, for instance. Mm. Why Netherlands? Uh, you know, the why it's standards. I mean, why it's not France, for instance. Mm. Why it's not uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, why it's not Iran, for instance. Mm. Is there a criteria for the peace champions? I mean, is there standards to choose that country? Uh, or it should be kind of EU country. I'm sure that I will not reward visa again for for <laughs> Netherlands. But uh, <laughs> it's 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 that issue. I mean, it's it's came to my mind. What is the champion of peace? Mm. Why you you want to be the champion? Okay, it's a reward, but it's better to be more ethically. It's better to be uh, recognized from the others. Uh, it's like the noble. Uh, uh, rewards. It's like others. I mean, you know, to be kind of the lead and the champion for peace. Okay, why? Because you donate more, but your money did nothing on the ground. Mm. Uh, because you did more trainings, okay, what is the result? What is the impact? So this is, it's, it's, I cannot understand actually, Mama. Mm. Well, that's actually a really interesting question that I think you may be posing to me a little bit as well. As an advocate who's worked on this for a decade and a half, I don't look to a country because they have a name or because they belong to a certain you know, organization or group. I look to the countries who are willing to back up what they say with the resources and the expertise, putting someone in um, the in NATO as the mm -hmm. head of women, peace and security is an amazing, you know, that's an amazing thing to offer. I think those are the people that we look for are not just the ones that say protection is important to us, but the ones who are willing to actually then go and pull their friends in and say, hey, this is an important issue to us. Here's why we think it's important to whatever regional or international organization that we're part of. And this is the work we're willing to do. And will you come along with us? But I'm, 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 I'm actually fascinated by your question because where, where do you, what gives you the impression that the Netherlands sees itself as the champion for peace? Is that? But what I see, the way we look at it is, first of all, we're part of a coalition mm. for peace. And I think we are, we know, first of all, we, know, we are a small country. So very pragmatically, we will never win anything, win our peace with military force, you know? So we, have, we need a, a sort of more diplomacy and conviction uh, to stay safe as well. But I think it's, it's felt as a member of the international community that we have to play our part, like we expect others to play their part, to uphold the international rule of law and international peace as one of the founding members of the United Nations. And we signed up, you know, we the nations, um, ha, um, having overcome the scorch of, preventing the scorch of war for future generations. Um, so it's like, as a member of the international community, we signed up for that, so we have to do our part. But we would never do that alone, and we can't do that alone. But even the United States can't do that alone. Mm. Um, and I think I heard Madeleine Albright, you refer to her, but I heard her say, you know, we, we are indispensable, but not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for all countries. We know we can never do this alone, but we feel we have to take our responsibility. And in our case, it's enshrined in our constitution. So, you know, that we will uphold a rules-based international system to promote peace and security for in everybody. Yeah. That's not in the lead. It's part of a coalition. It's or other call. So it's a responsibility, yeah, yes. and but not to say, look at how great we are. So that's yes, if okay. that's that's not what I, what if you mean if that's what you mean by champion. No, um, but again, I think you know. So that is it's very much our the task that we were, we are given also as civil servants, and particularly working on defense and diplomacy. Um, this is this is our assignment that we have to work with other countries to promote international peace and security. That's how I would see it. Yeah, it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> um, the next question is from Rachel Grimes, and I think she was referring to when you were speaking, so I'm going to direct this to you. Um, what does the speaker advise on identifying and approaching senior officers who are still serving to champion POC in such a genuine way? Oh, um, interesting question. Um, 
This is something, um, well, this is about internal transparency in discussion, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very important to start from the beginning, officers training already uh, on whatever level, but it's, it's uh, good to have discussions, to learn from each other, to be open, to be accountable. Uh, I think that's, that's most important. This is about, sorry, learning from your mistakes, mm -hmm. uh, being open, sharing your experiences. I think that's, that's what helps, okay. how it works. I did no mistakes. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you want to add to that? Or? I think that one of the things that made me think is that which is a bit of a, a concern. Um, we have got, gathered, you know, experience um, in, um, from the Balkans, the Great Lakes region in, Af in, in Africa, Rwanda, uh, all painful, you know, experiences mm -hmm. for humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I think, for all of us, really a, a, a precious task to make sure that the capacity and the leadership that came forward in those crises is recognized mm -hmm. and that we learn from that, you know, that we embrace those. Uh, and with the short set of planning cycles that we have, and also political cycles that we have in all our countries, the risk is that that leadership goes lost mm. and the, cap the capacities and the knowledge goes lost or isn't properly rewarded because we go for the next fashion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think that is, that is for all us as institutions, I think it is first and foremost, I think, to foster leadership, but then also to make sure that we recognize this and build on it for future challenges, which is, you know, challenges are constantly changing, but not to say, okay, now we move from region X to region Y and we'll start reinventing the wheel, for mm. instance. So I think that's part of the, the, that's what I read in the question as well, you know, um, and I fully agree that, that we have to make sure that all those that served uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, in Mali, you know, that their expertise and experience and leadership is recognized, but also used for, you know, for, for new challenges. Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely my experience when I meet senior officers that the experience that they have lived in, in where they've been deployed, yeah. particularly like if you look at Eastern or, or, or European, mm -hmm. you know, organizations versus the U.S., for example, we don't deploy a lot to peacekeeping missions. Mm -hmm. So I see a very interesting dynamic between the experience that people have had and how they understand POC and what it means to them when they think about it. And it's a very personality-based and experience-based mm -hmm. um, approach that I think people adopt. I have a question. Which, we, which attaches great importance to the teams we have as well. Absolutely. And, and how we bring people together. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have a question for you, though I think it, it popped off, but I remember what, what it was <laughs> in my brain. This is really challenging, actually. It's. <laughs> It's like playing a board game. Um, so I think the question was about lessons learned in Afghanistan um, on security force assistance um, and POC. And if you see any way for those to kind of translate from the Afghanistan experience into the Sahel. Okay. There are uh, many similarities between Afghanistan and the Sahel zone, you know. Uh, what do uh, the international actors uh, found in, in this uh, area, it is the, the fight against, uh, you know, terrorism, jihadist groups. Uh, as a result, we, we have been witnessing uh, the increase of the insecurity, mm -hmm. the, inc the increase of uh, the instability. So it, it means that it is the opposite result that uh, we are uh, facing. So uh, if we, we, we would like to, 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 to avoid uh, Afghanistan case, mm. we, we have to, 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 to reconsider, you know, uh, our way of viewing uh, the insecurity, the, the, the causes of insecurity in this region. The, the, there are many causes, you know, and complex causes. You know. the, the, the international actors have reduced them uh, into uh, migration, contentment, and uh, the terrorism uh, uh, threats also. So, uh, we, we have time to to correct, uh, you know, our game, and we have time also to to avoid the the Afghanistan in the Sahel, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, uh, the, the, the 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 overall result showed us that uh, we are mistaken, and we have to to correct our uh, possibility of reducing the insecurity in this region. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I'm going to turn back here to the board. Based on what um, Admiral Stavridis says, do the experts on this panel have any uh, have the idea that the notion of POC and soft power is losing popularity to using force remotely? It's losing force to. Sorry, mm. is losing popularity to the use of force remotely? So remote warfare, drones, when you're, you know, not necessarily having hu your humans yeah, on the ground. No, yeah. it, it makes it different for sure. Um, it's more uh, like like it says. It's it's more remote. It, mm. It's more standoff. But it I don't. It even uh, gives more importance to protection of civilians. I think uh, it might not be what we see yet. But I think this is what is really is important to to be sure that notwithstanding the type of weapon you use, mm. protection of civilians is a key issue, and we should give attention to it and. and well, recognize what's needed. I so yes, it's something to think about. Sure, uh, it's well, I can't deny, but yeah. it doesn't diminish mm. the importance. Yeah, Instead, absolutely. Instead, it should yeah. increase th maybe the well, importance. Well, in some of ways, it. it makes it harder, right? Because you don't have the richness of ISR capabilities and all of the various things that you would have if you did have a ro very robust force, including humans from your own force on the ground. Sure. Um, let us see. I'm the only one who cannot see the, the questions. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, trust me, you're better off. <laughs> um, so Olivier, what are the three main practical contributions protection of civilians champions can make to security in your area or region? And then I actually want to reflect that to you as well. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first one, we, uh, you know, our contribution is to, to, to help international actors to better pinpoint the area of areas of action in terms of uh, civilian protection you know so uh, if you you want to to have added value in this region you have to also to, to to support to give support to the the civilian actors i mean the uh, uh, non governmental actors like uh, associations and ngos also so that's the the first one the second one, you know, you have to build your response to the insecurity threats uh, based on the, the real needs of the population. Mm. You know, because uh, terrorism is a, a wide topic and also a threat. You know? mm. So you have to, to better uh, understand the, the population's needs and uh, give the, the right response to these needs. And uh, finally, you know, if you distinguish governance from uh, the, the global uh, support to the security forces, you can't uh, succeed in, in this way. So I think that uh, the countries like Netherlands and also uh, some European uh, countries have the opportunity to, to, to give us, uh, when I say us, <laughs> give us the salient people uh, an added value support uh, in order to, to change the, the dynamics. Because uh, the way France is viewing uh, its interest in the region, the way that US uh, government is viewing uh, its interest is not helpful for the people like uh, uh, civilians and the other categories of population. Thank you. Thank you. Same question to you. Okay. Uh, I'm already contributing, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's worth to mention that uh, my work with the uh, government of Iraq is unpaid work. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm volunteer, actually. Uh, and I'm doing, uh, you know, 50% uh, of my time is to the government, actually. And they are paying me uh, no penny, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it's worth to... Uh, to say that uh, uh, the government of Netherlands, if we are talking about uh, the government of Netherlands uh, uh, assistance, uh, that there is a huge amount of assistance and donation coming from uh, the government of Netherlands to the Iraqi government and to the civil society to improve the society of Iraq, and especially in topics like um, uh, women empowerment and uh, 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 leadership. So it's, 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 uh, it's worth to say that there is uh, initiative uh, from the government. But to improve that, we should use like uh, the best examples 
of successful stories. And I think for your government, you have some organization, they already have like the best success stories. For instance, uh, uh, not because they are invite us, uh, PAX, uh, one of the organization that uh, every Iraqi knows, but they are not registered. Uh, but we everybody, everybody knows them because they did a lot mm. uh, to the country. And uh, to be kind of the moderator for, for some issues like Hawija, for mm -hmm. instance, it shows how much respect they show Iraqis. And when they are talking uh, uh, to Iraqis, they are not talking in behalf of your government, but they are uh, from your government. So they are talking in, in human beings way mm. to show your role, to do your role, investigate, transports, and reaching the people. Mm -hmm. So it's better to empower these organizations. This is, this is uh, uh, one of the contribution uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the next steps. And to empower leadership on the ground too, uh, from your government. Uh, I'm sure that you heard about uh, the limit of, of, of our uh, corruption cases. It's a huge, and usually, uh, uh, usually, uh, we keep ourselves on the bubble of covert. So a person like a donator, human rights stabilization donator, he knows that organization, he dealt with them before, he doesn't want to risk to deal with another organization. So this is one of the contribution that they should use multiple actors on the ground. It's not about that organization or this organization. It's about reaching as much as you can from your people or from others' people. And that's create you as a champion. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our event here. So um, I wanna just give each of you maybe just a minute quick minute or so to make a final point, and then I will wrap us up. Do you want to start? <laughs> um, I think it's, a, it's a, I think first of all, it's, it's um, no, let me say this. I think, I think this, this conversation is very important and needs to continue um, um, clearly, and it helps us to really reflect on why we do the things we do. And to to reflect on at least for us, you know, from my perspective, you know, do are we doing the right things and are we doing the right things right? Um, and listening also particularly to your experience, it really reconfirms a lot of the things that indeed, you know, that we need to ask better and from the start what the needs are. You know, to start the starting and the end point has to be the people we protect, um, and 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 that you know we have the willingness to listen. I think this is something we work on in my ministry. You know, um, so when we talk about peace and security, whose security are we talking about, and who can be the actors that can help us to ask the people to 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 ask directly to the people and make sure we respond to those needs rather than think from our own experience or from our blueprint approaches that this is how we do protection of civilians or how this is how we do stabilization um, so yeah i think that is maybe you know um, um, do we ask the right question to the right people that's always the question in our work <laughs> uh, and and this 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 table really helps to, uh, to reflect on that and to get new ideas on how to do better. Excellent, thank you. Olivier? Thank you very much. I would like to thank all of you because uh, it is uh, very important for me to discuss directly with the representative of the Netherlands uh, government. But I would like to, to, to ask you to, to regard me as a spokesman for the NGOs. Uh, Chadian NGOs, the Sahelian NGOs that need your support in order to, to better help people uh, uh, having, you know, the best re response to the security threats. So I am a spokesman for my organization <laughs> before. <laughs> also, I, I would like to, 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 to let you know that you have the opportunity to change the game in the side. So do differently things, and we, I hope that uh, we will resume with the security uh, that we, we lost. Thank you very much. 
thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for uh, uh, the, the guest actually, uh, the, the government of Netherlands, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The Ministry of Defense, of course, uh, uh, they start with sharing that uh, 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 it's a, a kind of apology of what happens, uh, but we are, will wait for more results uh, after this uh, event and uh, we will follow the news uh, to see what kind of results after this uh, event and we can continue uh, 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 for more serious uh, uh, events. And uh, I think with internal uh, elements, external elements, uh, I found trust uh, uh, between uh, the government side and external between uh, your government and your uh, uh, other uh, colleagues of countries to build that trust uh, uh, with people and with uh, uh, your uh, colleagues as a government. Uh, we are missing that because as much as you will be transparent, you will build that wall of trust uh, between uh, all. Thank you. Just about out of time, so I'm going to give you the last word here. Very short. <laughs> now I, I'll I'll end with uh, with what I started with. Uh, protection of civilians is a theme on, on which we never uh, done learning. Uh, it's about well talking between ministries. Uh, it's about experience we build, we take from from previous experiences. It's about the people where we're working for and where we're doing our jobs for, and it's about discussions like this. So I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. All for these conversations we had today. Yes, and for me as well, my heart felt thanks. This was such a fantastic panel, and I know it was probably very hard sometimes to be in front of cameras and to have mm -hmm. these really frank discussions. So I thank you. Um, and with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you.